Almighty God and Heavenly Father, these are important days in America as we are preparing to elect the next president and vice president and others on Tuesday. And so I bow with your people now across the nation on this weekend, and I pray for us. I pray that we will vote. And I pray that we will vote with a sense of profound gratitude and thankfulness for a democratic system that at least partially holds in check the folly and evil in all human hearts so that the power which corrupts so readily is limited. I pray that your people would know and live the meaning of being in the world but not of it. Doing politics as though they were not doing them, but doing them. As being on earth with our lives hidden in Christ, in God. As rendering to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. I pray that we would discern what truths and what values should advance by being made laws and which should advance only by the leavening of honest influence. I pray that your people would see what love and justice and wisdom, far-seeing wisdom, demand in the issues of education, business and industry, health care, marriage and family, abortion, welfare, energy, government and taxes, military, terrorism, international relations, and every challenge that we will face in the years to come. Oh, grant your people far-seeing wisdom to discern what love and justice mean. And above all, I pray that we will treasure Christ and tell everyone of his sovereignty and his supremacy over all nations and that long after America is a footnote to the future world, he will reign with his people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and we will be priests in a kingdom on the new earth. Oh God, keep us faithful to this all-important word of yours to which we now turn. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 1, verse 14. We'll be two weeks on this text, 14 to 18, Lord willing. And almost all of our time tonight will be spent on verse 18. So you can just bore in with me at verse 18 and not fret about uh, wondering why your questions about 15, 16, 17, and 18 didn't get in. I mean, uh, uh, whatever. <laughs> Those other verses. We're going to spend almost all of our time on verse 14. I got that wrong. 14. And uh, if you have questions about 15, 16, 17, and 18, then they wait till next time. Verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. That's the main point of the paragraph. Now, let's go back to verse 1 and find out who we're talking about here. The Word became flesh. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the point of verse 14 is that the word God, that is God, the word, becomes human without ceasing to be God. That's the main point of the paragraph. 
God the Son becomes human without ceasing to be God the Son. The Word is the Son. You see that in verse 14? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld, we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son. So now we got two words we can use to refer to the same person. Son, Word. Son of God, Word. Now, that's real important. Muslims can't handle that. We need to try to help them handle it. You say to a Muslim, uh, God the Father has a son. They will compute, usually, God had sex with Mary and had a baby. And we Christians call him son of God. Jesus. That's their understanding of what we mean when we use this kind of language, biblical language. We can't abandon the language. That's not what we mean. Verse 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. That's the Son. In the beginning. In the beginning was the Son. Meaning, as far back as you go, there he is. Wherever you want to locate the beginning, and I located in eternity, he was there. Because it says in verse 3, all things were made through him. Mary was made through him. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. God the Father wasn't made. The Son made everything that was made. Therefore, the Son was not made. And so let's help everyone, whether Jehovah's Witnesses or Muslims or whoever, who stumble over the doctrine of the eternal sonship of the second person of the Trinity. Let's help them by just stating biblical reality. The Son of God had no beginning. The Father had no beginning. You don't have to understand the fullness of this mystery. You just need to say biblical truths about it and therefore guard the mystery. That's one of the things doctrine does. It protects mysteries. If you don't hold doctrine in right biblical proportion, mysteries become stripped to pieces by sectarian explanations, which are almost always wrong. Well, there's so much more to say about the doctrine of the Trinity, but we have touched on it. We are touching on it. We will continue to touch on it through the Gospel of John. But hold that much in your mind right now. The Son and the Father are one God. The Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son. They are both God, and they are two persons in the one Godhead. We are not tritheists, we are monotheists, like Muslims are monotheists. Jews are monotheists. There's only one God. That he exists in three persons does not compromise his singularity as one divine nature. Hold that as we move on through this passage. Now what verse 14 says is, and this is one of the most important events in history, maybe the second most important after the cross, and it was necessary for the cross. The Word, who was God, who always existed, who created all things, the Son, became flesh. That is, became human without ceasing to be God. Now, why do I think that? That's what we're going to spend the first half of this message on. Why do I think that? And we'll look at it because there are reasons given in verse 15, 16, 17, 18, and here in verse 14. Here's the first reason why we believe that the Son of God, the Word, the eternal divine Son, second person of the Trinity, became human without ceasing to be God. I, I stress it because there are historically have been groups who say, oh, well, of course, but he forsook, he emptied himself, he left it all behind, he was God no more. So you don't have two 
natures in Jesus Christ, divine and human. You just have one nature, they say. And I'm arguing right now for a great, old, orthodox, historic truth, namely that the Son, as He becomes human, does not cease to be the divine Son. We have a person with two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. That's what I'm going to be arguing for now. Why do I think that is the case? The first reason is given in verse 14. It says and dwelt among us. What's the subject of the verb dwelt? The subject of the verb dwelt is the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word from verse 1 is now dwelling among us. You can't shift it. You can't say, He's gone. He vanished. There's just this thing called Jesus who's not that. He's just human. That won't work. The grammar simply says, the Word was dwelling among us. Which is why Matthew 1.23, you know this verse, Christmas verse. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Immanuel, which means God with us. Not God emptied of himself. But God with us, born of a virgin, conceived of the Holy Spirit, that he might have two natures, not just one nature, divine and human. Second reason, besides the phrase, and dwelt among us, also in verse 14, we have seen his glory. So the word becomes flesh dwells among us, we have seen his glory. What glory? Whose glory? What kind of glory have we seen? Glory as of the only Son from the Father. Question. Let's be real careful. When it says... The glory you're seeing in Jesus, the Son, the incarnate Word, is as the only Son from the Father. Does that mean it's not the glory of the only Son from the Father? It's only like it. That's the kind of thing some sectarian will lay on you. It's only like it. It's not it. As is a tricky word in English and in Greek. Same tricks. You think knowing Greek solves problems? It doesn't. It creates problems. You can solve as many problems probably thinking very hard about your good literal English Bible than many scholars knowing Greek can solve. So let's solve this one just thinking about the word as for just a moment. Don't want to go too deep. I mean, don't want to go too crazy. <laughs> If I say to you, I have a book to give away, and I would like to give it to you as my first choice, as my first choice. What's the word as mean there? Like, you're not my first choice? You're only as my first choice. That's obviously not what I mean. The word as doesn't demand that meaning. In that sentence, it clearly doesn't mean that. And I'm going to argue that given everything in the context here, as doesn't mean that here either. I'm going to give it to you as my first choice, as my first choice. You don't say, I guess I'm not your first choice. I just said I'm going to give it to you as my first choice. Because as means as you really are my first choice. And that's what I think it means right here. We have seen his glory as he really is, the Son of God. No reason to construe that as saying he's not. This is not his glory. When everything in the context is saying <laughs> the word has come. The Son is here. He is dwelling among us. We are seeing his glory. In fact, it says, it says that. It says 
earlier in the verse, the word became flesh and dwelt among, dwelt among us. We have seen his glory. And his is the son, the word dwelling among us. Not as his glory, meaning not his glory and something like it. The word became flesh and Christ, Jesus, that phrase, by the way, the name Jesus Christ occurs for the first time just a couple of verses later. We haven't even seen that name yet in the Gospel of John. You'll see it next week. So you have the word, you have the son, you have Jesus, you have Christ, and they're all the same person with two natures now. Divine, because verse 1 says the word is God and human, because verse 14 says he became flesh. Now, that's my first concern. Here's my second concern, and there are only two concerns. What does that mean for us? Okay. I finished my little doctrinal piece, my big doctrinal piece, Short but big. And now when I ask the kind of so what question, what does that mean for us? There are a lot more reasons why we should think about that doctrine and believe it that we'll look at next time. But I'm just pausing here now to spend the rest of this message on the practical piece of so what. Let me tell you why I'm, I'm structuring this sermon this way. Why am I stopping here when there's so much more doctrinal to see in these verses and asking the so what for us question? And my first reason is the text answers the question. (laughs) It pleads to me as I'm reading it. Talk about me. I've got really important things for your people here. That's the first reason. Here's the second reason. Do you recall a couple of months ago that we spent two or three weeks pleading with the Lord in preaching that he would come to us as a people and renew and deepen and strengthen what we were calling our relational culture. Remember those days a few months ago? And we were focusing at the time in large measure upon Philippians 2, 3, 4, 5, which goes like this, do nothing from, it's Bethlehem now, relational culture, Bethlehem North and South Campus, Saturday Night North, Bethlehem. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility, Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And we were were just crying out, Lord, John Piper is not the best at this. And he would like to grow and not be in the way of this. Remember those days? And and we want to grow as a people. We want to do better at this. We want to love each other better, serve each other better, not be so selfish, not be so ingrown, be more risk-taking in relationships, be outgoing to people, both like us and unlike us, talking to each other, not running away from each other. Grow us in this. Don't let us be stuck anymore. There's so many stuck people in their relational capacities. Remember those days? Well, there was a basis for what we were saying. Do you remember it? If you just keep reading in Philippians 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which was yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. That was the basis. In other words, Jesus was God. And in order to serve us and save us, he humbled himself and he became a human that he might be obedient unto death, even death on a cross. 
That was the basis. We're saved by Jesus, and he is our model for how we need to be with each other. That was the basis. So the reason I'm, I'm pointing this out here is lest somebody say, well, I guess we did our little relational piece last summer. I guess we did our little, our little periodic relational emphasis last summer. And now we're into theology. No, it doesn't work like that. The only theology that counts for anything is Philippians 2 kind of theology and Gospel of John kind of theology. And both of them are delivered in the New Testament to uphold relational transformation. It's it's just crystal clear in Philippians 2. Have this mind among yourselves which you saw when Jesus was incarnate, the Word became flesh. And John, he reads, this is a big chapter now, I mean, this is a big book, 21 chapters long, and he gets to chapter 13. By this they will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Or chapter 15, verse 12, love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than that he lay down his life for friends. The Gospel of John and the book of Philippians are both massively theological to the end that we as a church would grow in our capacities to love each other and our enemies better. So please, do not have the mindset nor nor cease to pray for me that our years-long tenure in the Gospel of John will be anything other than an advancement through right theology of greater love, greater kindness, greater gentleness, greater patience, greater meekness, greater coming out of ourselves, greater courage, to say the hard thing and say it tenderly. All the things that make, make a church work as something unusual from the world. More servant-like, less proud, less selfish, less withdrawn, more caring. We don't have to leave the Gospel of John in order to do that. It's right here. So the Word became flesh and dwelt among us is exactly the truth that Paul used to transform the Philippian church so that they would stop thinking so much about their own interests only and start being interested in other people. So we're not away. We're just right there again. So the question is, I've just been telling you why I'm asking the question, what does it mean for us? What does it mean for us that the word became flesh? Well, verse 14 says this. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. It means that in Jesus Christ, we see the glory of God. It means that the glory of God in Jesus did not come to consume us, but it came full of grace and truth. The glory of God in Christ is his gracious disposition toward us without compromising his truthfulness, his faithfulness to himself. Why does he use the word full, full of grace and truth? Because it's really, 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 really big. If you have a container as big as Jesus, the Word eternally who created all things, and it's full of grace and truth, that's a lot of grace. This is really good news. It could have been otherwise, couldn't it? God could have chosen to become flesh as a judge. 
and an executioner. He could have just said, in the fullness of time, I'm done. I've been working with this planet for thousands of years. And what do I get? No fruit. I'm done. And I'm sending a judge. He will do that. But he didn't do it. The Son of Man did not come to condemn, but to save. John 3, 17. He came full of grace and truth the first time. We live in that period between the two comings of the king. He came full of grace and truth. The word became flesh to be gracious to us. And it was grace shaped by truth and not compromising truth. It's not wishy-washy grace. It's not unprincipled grace. It's not sentimental grace. There's a lot of sentimental grace in the world. And so many people don't have a biblical understanding of, of God's grace. Paired with truth and always vindicating truth and always holding fast to God's truthfulness and his faithfulness to his own infinite worth and glory. It will be a righteous grace, a God-exalting grace, a costly grace. This grace is going to lead straight to the cross because at the cross is the only place where truth can stand if grace is going to stand. God cannot justly simply wipe away your sin and my sin. If he comes with grace to save sinners, he cannot, and this is, this is what the world doesn't get without our helping them and teaching them. This doesn't, these categories are not in the natural mind. He cannot simply say, we will let bygones be bygones. Because truth, faithfulness, truthfulness means My glory has been defamed. My name has been trampled in the dirt. My purposes have been rejected. My justice calls for punishment. That's real wrath. And and yet he's so gracious. He's so full of grace. So what does he do? He clothes himself with flesh that he may die. The reason the Word became flesh is so that when the Son of God goes to the cross and dies, grace could abound and truth could be upheld. Truth is upheld because sin is punished and grace abounds because we don't get punished. He gets punished. That's why he came. That's why he had to have flesh so nails could go through it. So his side could be pierced according to prophecy. So blood and water could flow out. So he could become a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That's the main reason he took on flesh. So if if you ask the question, what difference does verse 14 make for us. It makes all the difference in the world for us. We see his glory, and it is a glory as of the only Son, and what marks the glory, it is full of grace, and it does not compromise truth. And that required the cross. Love the cross. Help your neighbors understand the cross. Invite your neighbor during the Advent season to go out for lunch and just ask them for 15 minutes. You know, don't kind of wiggle around, oh, sure hope this turns to Jesus somehow. Just ask them. Can I, can I take 15 minutes and tell you 
the most important things in my life? Would you just let me do that? And then you take 15 minutes and tell me the most important things in your life. And then just explain the cross. It doesn't matter if they laugh. doesn't matter if they believe. doesn't matter. I mean, it matters if they believe, but that doesn't govern what you, you say. You just do it. You just explain these things. You take out a napkin and draw a little pit, you know, and the, draw a cross across the top. Just do it whatever way. You can't believe how many people have been saved off napkins. Napkin evangelism in restaurants is very fruitful. <laughs> because they, they see you love them. They see you love them. You're just not playing games anymore. You're not trying to get a soccer analogy, you know? Just, just tell them. Just ask them if you can say it. Be careful here. Lest you say, I can't, we're not there. We can't see it. It says, we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only son from the father. But we weren't there. We weren't there. So we can't. They saw it, we don't. You religious types, you talk about the glory of the Son of God all you want. He's not here. You can't see him. Blah, blah, blah. Religious mumbo jumbo. Verse 14 at the end. Just mumbo jumbo. You can't see him. He's not here. And we weren't there and there were no videos. So what's this sea talk? Just be careful you don't talk like that. Be patient with people who do. This glory here in verse 14 is not outward physical brightness or beauty. Jesus wasn't bright and beautiful physically. He was not glorious. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus was homely. Plain. Would have been on no magazine cover except to mock him. Like most of us. Just plain. So don't bring up this objection. We can't see his glory. There wasn't anything to see in his physical nature. If you'd seen him, you would have yawned on to the next teacher. And don't think that his glory consisted in miracle working. Guess what? Thousands of people saw it and didn't see anything. You know how many people were standing at the tomb of Lazarus? He'd been dead four days. He stank. And Jesus raised him from the dead. And do you know what people did? They went to the Jewish leaders to plot Jesus' death. If they go on like this, people are going to believe in him, they said. Like, yes, but evidently not. Not for many. So don't make the mistake of thinking that the glory consists in visible, physical miracles. Well, what is it then? If it's not his physical person and it's not merely his deeds, what is it? And the answer is, it is a spiritual, moral beauty that shines in and through his words and deeds, but is not synonymous with them. 
and you see this spiritual, moral beauty with the eyes of the heart, not the eyes of the head. And I get that phrase from Ephesians 1, 17, the eyes of the heart. Jesus said, seeing you do not see. What does that mean? It means you have two sets of eyes, one here and one here. Lots of people see with these and they kill him. See the same thing the others see, who, but they have eyes to see and they say, of course he's healing on the Sabbath, but you don't plot his death for that. You see glory in it. You see a spiritual glory in it. You see a majesty in it. You see a grace in it. You see truth in it. You see a self authenticating, wonderful, glorious reality in it. And that's the way people get saved. By the Holy Spirit, these eyes open. Listen to Paul's way of talking about this. This is 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is, because he's God incarnate, the image of God. The devil is blinding people's eyes. Some of you are blinded. I hope you don't stay blinded. And what that means is the devil is working overtime to keep every possible ray of light spiritually from shining into your dead heart so that you would recognize in the gospel something self-authenticatingly, majestically, gloriously true about Jesus Christ and would bow before him as your Lord unshakably in his allegiance. That's what the devil does not want to happen. And he's blinding the minds of unbelievers everywhere to keep them from seeing that. And that glory that's referred to in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 is exactly the same glory as verse 14 here. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. My prayer is that in preaching and living through the gospel of John, your eyes will be opened. Let me draw to a close by drawing your attention to the fact that verses 12 and 13 precede verse 14, and that's not an accident. To all who did receive him, Jesus, the word who became flesh, To all who did receive him and believed in his name, so receive, believe, he gave the right to become children of God. So you've got receive, believe, child of God, who were born, now you've got new birth, born not of the blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Born from above, born of God. Now you get four things, receive, believe, children of God, born, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we see... How do you see? You see only because you're born again. Until you're born again, you're dead. Dead eyes don't see glory. They see physical things. They can be scientifically so shrewd you could build a computer, put a man on the moon, figure out how to conquer a disease, but you just can't see spiritual reality. You can't see God for who he is, Christ for who he is, cross for who he is. It's all foolishness. So what has to happen? Let me draw things to a close by describing how it happens. Look at verse 4. Back up to 4. In him was life. This is the word. This is Jesus. This is the son. In him was life. That's what we need. When we're dead, we need life. And the life was the light of men. That's what we need. We can't see without light. What gives light? What opens the eyes so that they can see the light of the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Christ? The light of the glory of the Son of God, the light of grace, the light of truth. What gives light? Answer, life. And where does life come from? It comes from new birth. So let's walk through it. 
And listen very carefully. I'll be done in two minutes. Because this, this is life and death for some of you. We hear the gospel. That's why I preach. We hear the gospel. And through the hearing of the gospel, his deeds, Jesus' deeds, his words, his acts, his, his great, mighty accomplishment on the cross, God, through the word, awakens miraculously spiritual life in you. And the first effect of it is light. And that light is the glory of Christ. Another way to describe it is belief in Christ. Another way to describe it is receiving Christ. I think there are no sequences here. Life, light, faith, receive, child of God, all at once. You don't get born again to later become a believer. And you don't believe later to be born again, not even a second later. There is no way you can chop this glorious event up into pieces like that temporally. You're listening to the gospel, like right now. You're listening to the gospel. The Holy Spirit is brooding over the church. And according to his sovereign mercy and grace, he comes down and opens the eye of a blind and a ray of light shines in. Remember, I used the analogy. Is there any time lapse between opening your eyes and seeing light? No. (laughs) No, there isn't. To see light and to have life is simultaneous. And the heart embraces And the heart believes in all one great act. And you know, I'm a child of God. When it says, have the right to become a child of God, have authority to become a child of God, what that means is not that you're not the child of God. It means that belief, receiving, being born again, And seeing light are the authority to be a child of God. You are a child of God because you have been given the right and the authority in the work of God in your life in those great acts. So I close by lifting up the incarnate Son of God one last time. I lift him up before you. I'm not him. I am a witness. It was a man sent from John, sent from God. His name was John. And he became a witness. He became a witness. I'm just pointing you and lifting him up. The Word became flesh, Jesus, and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Have we not? Have you not? Is it not self-evidencingly compelling in your life? Can you really walk out of this room and want to have nothing to do with him? No, you can't. God, don't let that happen. Be compelling tonight. Be compelling this morning. Let's pray. Oh God, we cannot save a sinner. We cannot open the eyes of the blind. We cannot cause a dead heart to see glory, but you can. And we are asking that in this service of communion and preaching and singing and praying and waiting upon you, Holy Spirit, move in power and illumine our eyes, the eyes of our heart. You're a great Savior. And we praise you. Amen.